Hey YouTube, Tacoma Comics here, and uh, I don't know how many people look at these channel trailers or the trailers that you kind of post is like this is for new subscribers or people new to your channel to look at, but I thought I'd give it a try and just kind of give uh, what my channel is about and how I got into comics because it's a story that I kind of want to tell but I want to re-reference it every single time um, and retell it every single time during each video I'd rather be able to just reference it. So uh, I wanted to talk to you today. Just a little bit about comics. So, uh, I think memory is a funny thing. I think this is the one that started it all. Right? X Men 175. This came out in November of '83. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can. Down the bottom here, November 1983. Uh, written by Chris Claremont, penciled by a bunch of different people. This is not a uh, Jim Lee or John Romita Jr., any of the, the mainstays, but uh, it was there, and this one is actually a dollar because it was like a, what, 20th anniversary issue, so <laughs> Marvel jacking up the prices even then, though uh, most of the comics at that time, like here's 176, were uh, 60 cents, so read this comic, and, and I loved it, and I, you know, fell in love with the X-Men, all throughout high school, 83 was seventh grade, so you know, I graduated uh, high school in 89, six years later, I think that math is correct, yeah, um, and I, I collected comics all the time, and I just want to show you a little story about that, uh, so I'm going to take a break here. Okay guys, we're going to do this a little bit differently today, uh, show you where I grew up, way down here. Port Washington, Long Island, and I went to, it was never called Carrie Palmer, it was just Weber Junior High back in the 80s, and the campus is about twice as large now as it used to be, it used to be just this building, this part, this whole thing here is extra, but that's not the point of this story. After school, every day, I would walk this direction even though it's not the direction <laughs> to go to my house and I would stop off here in the corner as would half the kids from the high school and the uh, junior high. Baskin Robbins was next door my sister worked there but that's neither here nor there either. R right on this corner store here was a stationery store and I can't remember the name of it but it sold candy and newspapers and notebooks and stuff like that and also had a comic spinner rack. And that is where I would go to look for comics. I don't know how I started or why I started. I think I just went there following the masses as a seventh grader in junior high. But uh, once I found the comics, uh, it changed everything for me. That is where I would go. And from about 83 through 89, when I graduated from the high school up the road here, Paul D. Schreiber High School, from 83 to 89, I went there. Now, I would like to say monthly, but I probably went there on a daily or weekly basis to spin that spinner rack, look for new comics, and I can't imagine that there was a Marvel comic at the time that I did not uh, purchase. Um, you know, I had all the major series, X-Men, The Mutants when they came out, Avengers, Fantastic Four, Thor. Uh, don't think I collected Daredevil, but all the major Marvel stuff, you know, what you have to understand is at the time I wasn't aware if there was a comic that wasn't there. All I knew is that the comics that came out were the ones that I saw, and those are the ones that I bought. So if they were in my uh, on the spinner rack, that is what I purchased. I really was uh, very unaware of, of other comics. Um, I didn't read DC. Uh, I think it's because I'd grown up with the Batman TV show and the Superman TV show on reruns before that. And so having watched those, I kind of thought that's what DC comics were like. So I just became a, a Marvel person for for those reasons, no other reasons either. Um, at the time, comics were 60 cents, and I had a uh, caper out, so I was able to afford most of my habit, which, you know, something I'd like to be able to do today, but it's a little bit tougher, believe it or not. All right, so there's a little bit of history for you. And we're back from the break. So I uh, wanted to show you why I love this issue so much and, and what it did. It's just uh, really kind of crazy, so, you know. The gang's all hanging out. So this is what Claremont would do, right? They're all hanging out. They're cutting wood. Kitty's phasing. So I have no idea who these people are, but 
right there in that opening panel, you get the Westchester, and then they called something else, but it was the School for Gifted Youngsters back then. I know they've changed the name slightly. And you got Peter holding a tree, Nightcrawler standing on a tree, Kitty phasing through a tree, and uh, Wolverine. Just, just look at that um, pose that he's doing there. That, that's Wolverine, classic lumberjack, right? The cowboy boots, um, the claws extended, and just ripping right through that. And then all of a sudden, boom, something happens. And they're attacked, or they think they're attacked by Dark Phoenix, and, you know. Rogue captures Cyclops and Storm comes in. I had no idea who this punk rock chick was. All I know is that uh, I was firmly entrenched in uh, new wave music at that time, Depeche Mode and stuff. So punk rock was a little edgy for me. I moved closer to punk rock as I got older. But uh, that was like, wow, check her out. She's punk rock. That's so cool. I had no idea about the earlier stories where um, she would fought the Callisto and the Morlocks and changed. But, you know. Three pages in, we're all in uniform, and we're talking to Professor X, and he's going to use this machine called Cerebro. Boom. So if you've read any X-Men story over the last, like, 30 years, this is all familiar to you, all this stuff, and it's established so well, story-wise, right? And something happens. <laughs> Have you ever seen a Cerebro feedback? Because it happens nearly <laughs> all the time, and it attacks the user. So something's going on right there, and Professor X, his, his brain is fried, basically, and then Scott, all of a sudden, appears as Dark Phoenix. Dun, dun, dun. And so here's this, this big reveal. And Phoenix, and of course, there's lots of talking while there's battle because it's Claremont. And at the time, I did not mind. I don't know what it was, but just being a young teenager at that time, I liked my comics with battles and fighting. I had a crush on Kitty Pride. Look at that outfit. It was the 80s. 20 years from now, you look at the young outfits you're wearing, if I got any uh, young listeners, and you laugh too. Headbands, and she had a pet dragon, of course. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but she had a pet dragon. So Phoenix takes out most of the team really quickly. Rogue and uh, Wolverine says, I ain't going to fight you because I'm going to lose. Look. Five or six pages in, they establish that they're friends with a group of uh, alien race called the Star Jammers, who also get killed. And they call on the Avengers for help. If something happens to the Avengers, and Captain America gets blasted away. So I'm kind of freaking out here. I'm like, wow, check out this issue I got. Like, everybody's dying. This is awesome. You know, and then, as comics usually do, Cyclops wakes up from the infirmary realizes that something else is going on. It's all a dream. He tries to warn the X-Men, but they fight him. More warning, more fights. But they try to get him to the danger room. He tries to take him into the danger room, which is, again, now we get introduced to the danger room. So in this comic, man, I've been introduced to the team, the powers, their main foe, their leader, his main machine, the danger room, their house where they live, the other superhero teams at the time, you know, so it just really, really gets awesome. And then there's, there's a center fold, so right at halfway through, talk about story arc plotting, right halfway through, we switch, and Madeline Pryor, who's a redhead, I guess they think all redhead looks alike, wakes up and finds herself uh, in the layer of mastermind. I think he's a member of the Hellfire Club, if I recall. And uh, his whole shtick is, you know, using his brain powers to convince people things are happening that aren't really happening, and that's what he does. And there's more battles. He switch back. And then Cyclops eventually captures Rogue. He's going to use Rogue to uh, take uh, Professor X's powers away from him momentarily. Then he's going to communicate and teach everybody, oh, it really is all a trap. It wasn't Jean Grey, it wasn't Dark Phoenix, it wasn't Cyclops all the time. It was actually Mastermind. So they go after Mastermind. They capture him. And right at the bottom here, down here, sorry, right down here, Wolverine's about to kill him. So you do realize Wolverine's a killer. But Storm holds him back. No! That's not our way, you know. 
Kitty Pride arrives with a uh, first aid kit, which she calls an emergency medical kit, but it's really just a first aid kit. <laughs> and, you know, Madeline's alive and she's still in love with Scott. And then there's a uh, wedding at the end. So, and of course, there's a Return of the Jedi uh, video game, 8 <laughs> um, bit video game uh, advertisement in the back. But in that one issue, right, in that one issue, you have a complete story, you have battles, you have powers, you have near death, you have coming back from it, you get characters established, school established, bad guys established, uh, personalities established, you see a pet dragon, look at this ridiculous outfit that she's wearing in that headband, and I used to go to the roller skate rink when I was 13, love the girls in the headbands, don't, don't ask me why, why are you judging, don't judge, right, 13, what, what are you going to do, actually 12, I was 12 at the time. Um, it's crazy, but this, this comic, it just, it set the pace for everything. It set my pace for my falling in love with comics. Fell in love with this series too. This came out a few years later. Price is jacked up to 75 cents now. But, uh, you know, Key Comics, Key Comics Market Watch was, uh, showing this the other day and he was talking about how good the writing was in this. And, and I got to agree, you know, maybe the artwork's not, um, at the same level that the the Wolverine limited series was, but this Kitty Pride and Wolverine, if you haven't caught this, I think the story is better than the Wolverine limited series. This is pure Claremont, not writing with Frank Miller, just on his own. Um, and I really think it's worth a try. So this is something else that established Wolverine and Kitty as like my, my two favorite characters. Something else happened to me, uh, flipping around, and this popped up in that same spinner wrap. And so uh, I thought I'd give it a try. Totally different, not superheroes. Um, Band of Elves and uh, fighting and great artwork, amazing artwork, amazing stories. And I just kind of said, wow, I can give that a try. So I collected it, collected all 32 issues, I think. This is a Marvel reprint through their uh, Epic brand of a comic that was at the time the first really successful indie comic. Um, I'd gone back since then and purchased uh, number one. This is the format that they came in. This is Warp Graphics. They actually, if you're a collector, Fantasy Quarterly issue number one had the first ElfQuest, ElfQuest story, but the uh, authors, Wendy and Richard Peeney, did not like the way it turned out, so they actually started their own comic company called Warp Graphics, Warp for Wendy and Richard Peeney, W-A-R-P, and they produced ElfQuest in a large magazine format, black and white, um, there's issue two, and uh, it came out this, and then they, they continued on, and they're still doing the final quest now, 30 or 40 years later, so ElfQuest is an amazing, amazing thing. Um, and I collected the large format books of the ElfQuest, I've got all of those, I just read them to my kids this summer, uh, and they fell in love with ElfQuest, so I thought that was really cool. They're actually coming to Comic-Con with me to meet Wendy and Richard Peeney. Um, you know, having your kids at Comic-Con is amazing, but also they have to, uh, they don't have the tolerance for long lines that an adult does, so it's going to be a mixed bag. But anyway, that was 83 through 89, right? Collecting all that stuff and everything you just saw is stuff that I got again because I had sold my collection in the mid-90s, um, I went to college in 1989 uh, and didn't have the money for comics. Comics were up to about a buck each then. Wasn't making money like it was and had other interests in college, partying and studying, um, studying and partying. Not sure which order that goes in, but uh, just wasn't really into comics, you know. Um, and that's the 90s. That's when comics got really weird. Image did its thing and uh, everybody was leaving and superheroes got bigger and musclier and Claremont left X Men at two, uh, was it two eighty nine, and that was right about that time. So a number of reasons, just kind of lost interest, gave up, came back from college, and I didn't have a job. Dirt poor, sold my collection. Dun dun dun. Yeah, sold my collection uh, mainly to a kid down the road um, who still has them in his basement. They're in horrible con or his parents' attic. They're in horrible condition. He's moved on now, but. He's not interested in selling them back. He wants more than I think they're worth um, because I guess he doesn't understand condition. I'm not blaming him. You know, it's not his job to sell them back to me. But uh, I moved, uh, you know, 
grew up, got married, got job, moved to uh, Tacoma. That's why we got Tacoma Comics. And I was wandering around. Uh, I guess my wife had left for vacation early with the two kids. I still had um, work for a couple of days. She went back to New York a little bit earlier. And so I went to a comic book shop because I didn't really have time to do that on my own. And I uh, was just asking, you know, what's what's new, what's good? And a guy in the comic shop, like, he showed me some X-Men stuff. There's one of the new X-Men series started. And, you know, you can't go back. It just wasn't like the X-Men I remembered. And, you know, if you like X-Men of any generation, the current X-Men Blue, X-Men Gold, you like X-Men Red, you like all new X-Men, whatever you like, that's great. But, you know, you can't go back and, and discover or rediscover that magic. You've got to find new magic. And so he... he Recommended a bunch of stuff, and the one that I tried was Lock and Key. And uh, as amazing as this artwork is, I always thought that the cover of the first issue wasn't the best, but, you know, that's real squibbling and <laughs> squabbling over details. If you never read Lock and Key, this is an amazing, amazing comic. It was written and planned out by uh, Joe Hill and drawn and planned out by Gabriel Rodriguez, who's an amazing artist. He's doing his own thing called Sword Quest now. Um, it's just just a fabulous comic, uh, horror comic, but about teenagers. A lot of shout outs and, and callbacks to uh, comics, including to the X-Men. So I guess Joe Hill and I are of an age. Um, Joe Hill is Stephen King's son, but he doesn't go by uh, King, his last name. He wanted to make it on his own, and he certainly has. Um, absolutely gorgeous artwork. Uh, amazing, amazing storyline. Um, wrapped up a little dorky right in the end, but you know, one issue out of like thirty-six that wasn't spot on, and just, just really excellent. So I love this stuff. And so from there, I discovered, hey, you know, I'm not really uh, into superhero comics right now. Just not digging into some of the stuff that's going on. Um, couldn't really follow along with it. Uh, you know, so didn't didn't love it, but I decided some of these independent comics are, are good and uh, discovered Image Comics. I discovered what I call my favorite uh, my favorite comic is the uh, Saga of the Rat Bitch Sweat Sex Queen. That's not really the name of a comic, but that involves Saga. This is not uh, this is just in a protective case I bought. I don't actually have this one um, slab. That's Fiona Staples. I met her at Comic Con two years ago, Emerald City. I was shaking when I met her. I don't know why, but I was super nervous. Um, wow, did we get dark all of a sudden? Rat Queens started off great, got really weird, had an issue with one of the creators, Rock Up Church, got redone and started again and is amazing again. Um, what can I say about Rat Queens? If you don't know Rat Queens, this is a phenomenally fun comic to uh to read bitch planet by kelly sue DeConnick. um yes it's a feminist comic and i love it it is uh a planet called bitch planet i guess referred to as bitch planet it's probably not the actual name of the planet where um women who are non-compliant are imprisoned um and so there's a lot of politics a lot of fighting a lot of uh sci-fi stuff Right in there, Kelly C. wrote, non-compliance is gender neutral. Thank you for that, Kelly. Uh, really awesome. And then her husband with Chip Zdarsky. I should say Valentine Le Delandro is an uh, artist on Bitch Planet. Uh, her husband does Sex Criminals, um, which is another amazing comic with uh, Chip Zdarsky on art. So that's where I call the uh, saga of the Rat Bitch Sex, sex Queen. Those are my... Uh, Top, kind of top four comics, all by Image, which I guess is not coincidental. Image is doing some amazing stuff. I have slowly gotten back into to Marvel um, and DC, actually. Tom King's work on Batman, forget about it. Tom King's work on Vision was one of the greatest things. His work on Miracle Man is pretty amazing. Um, I'm a big Miss Marvel fan. I just grabbed this one out uh, because this is my only slabbed comic. Um, you know, slabbing wasn't something around back when I first started reading comics, but uh, it is now, and not a fan of it. Um, I got this one because it was the only way to get this at the time. I have seen some raw copies on eBay, but I really wanted to get this in a, a good condition. So I'm not a big fan of slab comics. That's, you know, personal decision. If you are, great. Um, especially signatures. I love getting stuff signed by, by artists and writers and letters and inkers and even editors um, because I like meeting them. Not because I want to uh, 
make money off those comics. I don't picture myself selling my, my collection for money. Um, I don't speculate much. I don't go after the big books that I know are going to make money. I go after what I like. Um, so all respect to people who do slab their stuff and, and, and collect that route. It's just not my thing. Um, maybe it's because of how I grew up with comics. I grew up in a different era. Um, it's also a lot of money. You know, I don't want to pay a guy to follow me around Comic-Con to get me a COA to say this is really um, Matt Fraction's signature on Sex Criminals. This is really G. Willow Wilson's signature on Miss Marvel 101. Um, and then get the book slabbed and then I can never open and look at it. You know, it's just, just the way I am. So, like I said, all due respect if that's how you are. Um, but it's just not how I am. All right, so that's been kind of an introduction to me. I hope this serves as a good trailer. If you watch this, thank you. If not, I understand. It's kind of me just talking. Up the blues. Um, I met uh, Kevin Smith at the local comic book shop yesterday. I got him to wear my Chelsea scarf, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, so that's that. Thanks for, for watching. Uh, somewhere in this video, I'm going to edit in uh, some other footage, especially uh, show you a little bit of where I'm sort of not really actually storing my comics in my house. And also that little clip of uh, the Google Maps showing where I went to get my comics to try to give some historical perspective. This is Tacoma Comics. Like and subscribe. If you didn't like this, subscribe anyway. The other videos are more interesting. All right. Take care. Thanks. Now over here you have Lego City, which my uh, boys made and have remade several times. When they said that we were uh, thinking about moving, they actually took the third floor off, which I thought was really cool of them. Um, and you got some more Lego up there in the bookcase. And we foster dogs, so we got dog crate down there. And there is more Lego stuff all over here. That's one of my favorites. My son made an X-Wing fighter. Um, on his own, didn't follow any pattern or anything. Oh, look, there's lightsabers. So, you know, this is the uh, boys' room, the big boy and the little boy, the little boys, all sorts of stuff here. Uh, and then we come over here. This is where I want my comics to be. So, we got these nice shelves here. It's from Walking Dead, Why the Last Man. Uh, dude, if you haven't read the sculpt yet, read the sculptor. Uh, I think you got 100 bullets in lock and key there. And then Fables and just kind of Sandman sorted stuff. Saga hardcover and Elf Quest down the bottom. Lumberjanes and sort of marble stuff. The space in between we'll come back to in a second. Let me just move this chair out of the way. Uh, on the top there. Oh, there's some friends of ours. Got Vision, Champions, some Star Wars pops. Lord of the Rings in the back. Lord of the Rings Pez dispensers in the back. Coming down here. I think that's Ahsoka sideways there. It's Miss Marvel chess piece on top of some Star Wars and Miss Marvel Funkos. There's uh, the little Star Wars Lego guys I put in my other video. Some more Star Wars. Uh, I think Rin Dan's leaning over, falling on Animal there, playing the drums. Um, a Niffler pop. Looks like Ray in the background. Uh, some more graphic novels. And down the bottom. Some even more graphic novels, some uh, less superhero-y or more, uh, you know, fiction. Well, mouse isn't fiction, but, you know, maybe sociology or I don't know how you want to put it. Whatever. There's some more stuff there. In between here, you can see my fingers in the way. Construction equipment. My boys have also put Lego on top of there. Some drawers. These are all supposed to go into a big cabinet I'm building or I've been slowly building. I've got pieces of it over there. Come on over here, you'll see the, uh, you slide out for the drawers. Um, this all goes together, but I haven't finished making it yet, obviously. So I have big plans for this area over here, but it's not yet. So as you enter this uh, nondescript room, you see some of the larger comics that don't fit in the regular boxes, a pile of comics that are duplicates, or I'm trying to get better, uh, um, better quality issues of. Posters that I've yet to frame and hang. I got like the powers, the Star Wars we gave away with the uh, Force Awakens, Toys R Us, uh, Midnight Sale, Miss Marvel, Shaolin Cowboy, some Randy Emberlin stuff. There's uh, me and the boys with Chewie. That was a highlight. And Peter Mayhew, 
Awesome. Oh gosh. And there's comics. Comics, there's comics, there's comics, there's comics piled high. There's comics, there's comics, there's comics. There's an unfinished Star Wars puzzle. There's a finished Star Wars puzzle. So I kind of have a little bit of uh, everything here. This is supposed to be the third bedroom, but uh, right now this is sort of where I keep the comics. We're also sort of thinking about moving, so I've started packing stuff up, which is why you see these bins here. They're full of uh, oh, books and other toys, Lord of the Rings and Muppets toys and all sorts of stuff. So it's kind of just like a hodgepodge room now where I try to keep my comics as... as well sorted as possible but it's not um it's not ideal for sure it just it is what it is and it services the purpose that it's intended to serve